With the conclusion of the WoW Classic closed beta, we are drawn one step closer to the actual release date. I had the privilege to test the beta for nearly two months, with hours upon hours of time played. It was an incredible learning experience for me. I repeat this a lot, but I had to really buckle down and acclimate myself to the classic gameplay style once again. As someone who started out playing in 2004 and grew with every expansion, the game has truly evolved into a completely different one than how it was in its original vanilla state. As a result, I want to take note of what I learned in playing this closed beta in hopes to shed some light from someone who had previously been playing patch 8.1.5 before the beta and suddenly finding myself playing patch 1.12 on the 7.3.5 client. So if you are someone who hasn't played Classic in over 13 plus years and are used to the current gameplay style of WoW, I hope this video could help you out as well. Let's get started on the 25 things I learned from the Classic WoW closed beta. Number 1. Failure chance in gathering. In Classic, when you're gathering an item for a profession, you have a chance to fail when collecting it, prompting you to have to try again. In retail, if there's an herb ready to be collected, anyone in the area can collect it. It doesn't despawn for others once you grab it. Additionally, you collect all of its contents in one quick cast, rather than in something like mining in Classic, where you have to tap the node several times in order to collect all of the contents. And speaking of gathering professions, at number 2, once you learn one from a trainer, you have to manually click the track button in your spellbook for them to show up on your minimap. So if you have mining and herbalism as your two professions, you're only able to track one on your minimap at a time. On the same page, there's no way for you to track fishing pools either, you have to visually spot them in water during your travels. And if you die, you have to make sure that you recast the track button, or else you won't be able to spot the nodes on your minimap. And number 3, speaking of fishing, Svan brought this to my attention in one of his videos during the beta. If you have a high enough fishing skill, particularly higher than your current weapon skill cap at your current level, and you equip a fishing pole, you have a better shot at attacking higher level targets as the fishing pole has no glancing blows. And speaking of glancing blows, that brings me to number 4. A glancing blow is something that can occur when fighting a mob of equal or higher level to you. It only occurs on white damage hits, and depends on your weapon skill versus your opponent's defense skill. Last month, Blizzard confirmed that the hit cap in Classic WoW is effectively 9% for a player with 300 weapon skill, fighting a level 63 monster with a defense skill of 315. So if you ever wondered why someone has really stressed the importance of weapon skill, especially with racial abilities such as sword specialization and mace specialization, adding plus 5 to a human's weapon skill, now you know why. And since we're on the topic of weapon skills, I just covered the importance of keeping all your weapon skills maxed out. But not every class can use every weapon, and some classes have to learn specific weapon skills from specific trainers. Oftentimes, this trainer could be across the world. For example, for a night elf to learn crossbow skill, they have to either speak to Bixie Wobblebonk in Ironforge or Wu Ping in Stormwind. Number 6, Bag Space. If there's one thing I could stress that was a problem I constantly ran into while leveling, it was my bag space. If you get lucky early on, you may find a few small pouches to help with your inventory management. If not, you'll constantly be struggling with the good ol' inventory is full error message when trying to loot something. A trick that I learned early on is to create a bank alt immediately. All you have to do is create the new character. You don't even have to log on that character at first. But what you can do is just keep mailing stuff to that alt to hold onto extra items that you don't want to get rid of at the vendor. Then, when you get some spare time, switch over to that alt, run to the nearest mailbox, and sort out your loot. Number 7, Crafting Items. Speaking of inventory space, something that got removed in retail is the stipulation that you must have all of your crafting materials in your bags while crafting an item for your profession. In retail, the items could be stowed away in your bank, but in classic, they must be in your primary inventory bags. So before you go craft something, make sure you properly remove all of the materials that you need from your bank. And on the topic of crafting, you may notice that for higher level, harder to craft recipes, that the casting time to create them is a lot longer than that on retail. Same goes for gathering professions too, you'll notice the cast bar is a bit shorter when collecting something. Number 9, First Aid. And continuing with professions, I know this is said often, but I want to stress the importance of first aid. Especially for classes who don't have self heals. But for me as a paladin, there are times when I'm low on mana and using first aid is also super beneficial. A popular strategy is, if you're getting low on health, stun, kite, fear, do whatever you can to distract or slow a mob. Cast first aid on yourself, get as many ticks in as you can, then re-engage your mob, as an alternative to using a health pot, or if your health pot is already on cooldown. Regent vendors are absolutely NPCs of interest in Classic. Make sure you're aware of where all the Regent vendors are in your main cities. Certain abilities require a Regent, an item in your bag, to cast. 
For example, for a paladin to cast a greater blessing, they need a symbol of kings which could only be purchasable at a regent vendor. Moving on to number 11, before you hit level 10 in game, if you choose to resurrect from a spirit healer, you won't gain any res sickness. This is especially useful early on in the game. For me, at level 9 in the Elwyn Forest, I chose to get the flight paths to Red Ridge and Duskwood by following this method. It helps save you so much time later on, as you can easily fly to those locations rather than having to run. Number 12, some class quests are native to your race. I made a Night Elf Hunter and brought her to Stormwind so I could quest in Elwyn. When I hit level 10 to complete my Hunter quest to train a pet, I had to run all the way back to Dolinar and Teldrazil to complete it. I tried speaking to the Hunter Trainer in Stormwind and Ironforge in hopes they'd give me the Dwarven quest, but they didn't. The quest mandated that I return to Night Elf Land. I wanted to bring this up in case any of you are interested in creating a certain race and then transporting them across the world right from the get-go. Do your research on class quests and whether or not you'll have to travel back and forth to complete them. Number 13, Mounts at level 40. Most people know this, you unlock the ability to ride a mount once you hit level 40. For Paladins and Warlocks, you essentially get a free mount, but for everybody else, it could cost you anywhere from 80 to 100 gold based on your reputation with the certain faction. 14. Dismounting before in action. In Classic, some people may have either forgotten or haven't yet realized, but if you are mounted up and try to do an action, you'll receive an error message saying you are mounted. In Retail WoW, you'll automatically dismount if you cast or interact with something. But in Classic, you need to manually dismount yourself in order to complete that action. Some workarounds people use are macros, or just quickly tapping their mount button keybind to dismount. And on the topic of dismounting, one way you'll automatically get dismounted is if you swim in non-shallow water. You remain on your mount so long as you are still grounded within shallow areas of water, but once the water gets a bit deeper to enable your swim animation, your mount will auto-dismount. This is contrary to how it is on retail, where you will remain on your mount despite swimming. Moving onward to some dungeon stuff. At number 16, Meeting Stones. In Classic, the Meeting Stones are simply landmarks that signify the entrance of a dungeon. It wasn't until patch 2.0.1 where they evolved into summoning stones, where two players could summon allies, similar to a warlock's ritual of summoning. Now that we're on the topic of dungeons, at number 17, leveling through dungeons is not as effective as compared to how people spam them in retail. In fact, many argue that simply questing and or grinding out in the open world is a lot faster than continuously running dungeons. The only example, as I learned from my friend Saysafe in his guide on Wowhead, there are several dungeons that do make it worth your while, so long as you complete the easily acquired quests associated with that dungeon. For additional XP and rewards, the dungeons he recommends that are worth your time are Alderman, Zulfarok, Maradon, and Blackrock Depths. And, moving on to number 18, dungeon maps are not a thing in Classic WoW. I have a bad habit of spamming my M key inside a dungeon sometimes to see where I am, only to realize there is no map of dungeons in Classic. You have to rely on your minimap, memory, a friend as a guide, or just by looking it up. At number 19, another thing I realized from the classic beta is that you can only track 5 quests at a time. So if you're questing in a particular hub and want to make sure you're covering everything, make sure you're tracking the correct quests, but only up to 5, so choose wisely. Number 20, Weather Effects. In patch 1.10, rain, snow, and sandstorms were all added to the zones in World of Warcraft. You may also see clouds, fog, lightning, hear thunder, and more as you travel through Azeroth. The old weather effects are back in classic and really add to the immersion of certain zones. For number 21, a word on leashing. Leashing refers to the distance at which something you've aggroed will chase you. All leashes are different and vary. Non-boss mobs inside dungeons typically do not have leashes, meaning the only way you could get them to reset is by either dying or running outside the instance. Other mobs in the open world may only chase you for quite a bit. Some mobs have what seem to be like limitless leashes, as I'm sure you've seen some dragons and other destructive mobs kited into major cities in the past. Number 22, guards in towns hurt. Even though some towns are neutral, like Booty Bay and Gadget Zan, for example, don't try to engage in PvP combat inside the town. Even at level 60, they'll whoop your butt. So choose wisely when you want to gank somebody next time you're in a neutral town like that. In addition, there are more than meets the eye, as special extra guards may spawn too when PvP combat is detected. 23. Skills available every even level. Some skills can be purchased from your trainer at level 1. For example, Paladins could actually buy Devotion Aura at level 1 if they have the copper for it. But other than that, skills available for purchase through your trainer are only available at every even numbered level. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and so on. One mistake I used to make when I first played vanilla was getting excited after obtaining each level and checking my trainer to see if there was anything new that I could learn. It took me a while to realize the pattern. 
Also be wary that not every major town will have a trainer appropriate for you, especially if you're far from your original starting zone. For example, there won't be a druid trainer in the Undercity, just as there won't be a mage trainer in Darnassus, so be aware of where your nearest class trainers are at all times. 24. Use your talent points. And on the topic of new skills, don't forget that at level 10 and beyond, to use your new talent points after each level. Sometimes I'll ding a new level and realize I have three unused talent points just sitting around that I forgot to use. Make sure you use those points after each level. And number 25, the world feels a lot bigger. Transportation isn't as easy as using portal hubs in a major city, or getting on your epic mountain flying somewhere. You have to rely on boats, zeppelins, flight paths, and good ol' running around until level 40. As a result, the world feels a lot larger to me. You have to plan your routes efficiently, because travel can be very time consuming. So that concludes my 25 things learned from the classic WoW beta. Some of them were things that I compared to Retail WoW, other things were things that were taken out of the game, and so on and so forth. Either way, I hope you guys learned a thing or two. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel to show some support. You could follow my live stream at Quizzy TV over on Twitch and Quizzy TV over on Twitter as well. Let me know what you think about this video in the comments below, and if you have something that wasn't included in this video that you think I should take note of. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you all have a great day.